Good morning, church family, and thank you again for being with us at Heritage today. We are, uh, we are tackling the second half of a short series of sermons that we've called Wisdom and Warnings. And last week, if you were here and heard the message, we kicked off the series talking about Wilt Chamberlain, the famous NBA basketball player. And we talked about shooting free throws underhanded, and that was all part of a bigger, broader conversation about wisdom and where to find wisdom in your life. And part of what we got at last week is that one of the great challenges in life is that you have to, over time, you have to learn how to discern when someone is giving you input that's helpful versus when somebody's giving you bad advice. Of course, We'd like to think that we will recognize helpful input and bad advice when we hear it, right? Like we would like to think that our own savvy, our own smarts, our own instinct, our gut feeling will tell us everything we need to know to be able to differentiate between good advice and bad advice. But experience tells us. In fact, most of us have a list of experiences in our lives where our own intuition guided us wrong, right? Like we all have moments in our lives, in our story, where our following our intuition got us into a mess. And that's just kind of natural for us as humans. In fact, Proverbs chapter 28 says, those who trust in their own reasoning are fools, but those who walk in wisdom will be kept safe. And so the logical question that emerges after reading that kind of a proverb is, how do you become someone who walks in wisdom? How do you become someone who knows what good advice, good counsel sounds like? And it turns out that the answer to that has everything to do with where you source your wisdom. In fact, in this series, we're considering whether Jesus's advice, which was sometimes countercultural, sometimes unpopular, sometimes unconventional, we're considering whether Jesus's advice ought to be considered wisdom that we should build our lives around. Now, you already probably know that Jesus was known for making controversial statements. He said a lot of things that were provocative. But in this particular series, we're considering some of the unconventional things that Jesus had to say about money. And maybe you were surprised last week when I pointed out to you that Jesus has a lot to say about the subject of money. In fact, money is the topic of about 40% of Jesus's parables that he ever told, those little stories that he told to try to illustrate a point. And the things Jesus had to say about money were among the most provocative things he said among some of the most inflammatory statements that he made. Because when Jesus talked about money, he didn't talk about it like it was a neutral commodity. He didn't talk about it like it just was something that was benign. He talked about money as if it's a force to be reckoned with as if we have to figure out how we relate to this, how we're going to be in charge of part of it, how we're going to not let it be in charge of us. When Jesus talked about money, he spoke more about the risks associated with money than he did talk about the benefits of money. And in the text that we read last week, Jesus went out of his way to clearly spell out the point that he was making. In fact, here's what he said last week at the end of our text. He said, life does not consist in an abundance of possessions, which is the kind of statement that would have bothered people back then. And I think it's the kind of statement that bothers people from Jesus now. This is the kind of statement that flies in the face of our personal ambition. This is the kind of statement that flies in the face of our cultural assumptions. This is even the kind of statement that can kind of not jive with our logic. Because we live in a culture that's constantly telling us that your life will be better if you accumulate more possessions, right? I mean, it goes exactly against Jesus' statement right here. This afternoon, it's going to be on full display. I mean, think about this. Today, there's going to be this full docket, hours and hours of NFL football games, right? Do you know how long an NFL football game is? It's one hour. 
All right, it's, it's four 15-minute quarters, so it's one hour long. But how long is that game going to be on television to watch it, right? At minimum, it's going to be three. And if it goes into overtime, it could be more than that, right? Like every one of those games is going to last for at least three hours. And I understand there are stoppages in play. I understand that the clock doesn't run continuously. But part of the reason that the game is so long is because the players and the referees are standing on the field waiting for the, the TV commercials to be over because they're waiting for the commercialization to come to a conclusion or to a pause for a minute. They're waiting on the commercials. Advertisers are working hard all day today to convince us that we're missing out on the good life unless we upgrade our vehicle or we upgrade our smartphone or we upgrade our lifestyle somehow. I mean, we live in a culture where the size of the average family home has tripled in recent decades while the size of the average family has declined by about a third in recent decades. And yet one of the most successful business industries, they're constantly building new facilities right here around us, is the business that offers self-storage so that we can have a place to keep our abundance of possessions, right? Like this is the water that we're swimming in. But today I want to tell you about a story. I want to tell you a story about two young businessmen. This is a real, true, modern story. A story about two businessmen who came to see this entire struggle, came to see this environment and this culture from a different perspective. They, they were on track to bring home the kind of money and to build the kind of lifestyle that's portrayed in all of the commercials that are going to be on during the NFL games this afternoon. But then they had this encounter with the wisdom of Jesus about money, and it caused them to change their plans. I want to tell you the story about John Cortinez and Gregory Balmer. These are a couple of high-performing young professionals who don't live in our area, but if they did, they would fit in so easily in some of the nicest neighborhoods within just a few miles of here. John Cortinez is a Texan. He grew up in our state, and he got a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering at Texas A&M University, and he got hired on immediately after college. He got hired on with Chevron, working as a chemical engineer in the petro, uh, petroleum industry, and he was he was still in his early 20s, didn't have a whole lot of financial obligations, and he was making $150,000 a year with a job that he loved at Chevron. He felt like things were just heading in the direction that he wanted them to go. His career was getting off to a beautiful start. In fact, he, he says that at that time in his life, the password for his online banking account was retire at 40. That was the plan. And with that generous salary of $150,000 a year, John was socking away 50% of his income to be able to make that dream a reality. And Chevron came to him and said, hey, John, we want to send you to go get a master's degree in business. We're going to send you to Harvard to go get an MBA. And once you're finished with that degree, we've got a job waiting for you. And we're going to send you to the Middle East. And we're going to have a position there that's going to pay you $400,000 a year. And so John set out for Massachusetts and to begin the MBA program at the Harvard Business School, which is where he met Greg. Bomber and Greg had a similar story. Greg was in his early 20s and he had, had he had earned a finance degree at the University of Indiana and since then he'd been living in Nashville working for a private equity firm and they were paying him $275,000 a year. Now Greg had a little bit different spending personality. He wasn't quite so inclined to be thinking about retirement. He was inclined to think about the present and the ways he could enjoy spending that 275000 now. And so he was filling his life up with all sorts of luxuries that he hadn't experienced when he was growing up. And after a couple of years, after his career was getting up and going, Greg decided it was time to further his education as well. And so he also headed to Cambridge, Massachusetts, so he could attend Harvard Business School and get an MBA. And that's where he met John. And John and Greg, their stories had a lot in common. They had a lot in common with each other professionally and financially. And, but one of the things that they had in common was that they were both Christians. They'd both been raised in church. They both had made church a priority all the way through college and as young adults. And both of them had been taught from an early age, taught about the, ha the habit of tithing. You hear about this in church sometimes. John and 
Greg had learned about this Old Testament concept that refers to the practice of giving 10% of your income as part of your worship. And so John had done all the calculations, and he was given $15,000 a year to his church. And Greg had done all the math himself, and he was given $27,500 a year to his church, and neither one of them resented that at all. Like, they felt like they were, they were honored to give that. They were grateful to have the opportunity to give that. In fact, they both said, I was making enough money that I really didn't even feel. I didn't miss that money that I was donating. Greg said in particular, and this is a quote, he said, we both tithed before business school. We gave 10% of our income, and we thought... That's what a good Christian does. You tithe, and then you're good with money. It's like a membership fee to my church, essentially. And so they thought of their tithes very transactionally, sort of like paying taxes, like having something withheld from your paycheck, like buying a membership at Sam's Club or Costco. Greg and John felt like they had checked off the appropriate boxes and they were fulfilling the requirements and the expectations that God had for them when it came to money. And then they showed up in Massachusetts. And they got there for their master's program and they were trying to find it. They each were trying to find a church home and they ended up meeting each other in a men's Bible study at the church where they both landed. So they're part of this faith community together and they're taking business classes together. They're getting to know each other pretty well. And in their third semester at Harvard, they heard about a course that was being offered across campus, not in the business school, but in the divinity school, in the school of theology. They heard about this course that was that was being offered that was called God and money. And they thought to themselves, we like money and we like God and we have some elective credits that we need to fill in our degree plan. So they decided to take this course together. And what happened in that class was that they got in there and they started having big discussions as a class about scripture and ethics and economics. And they talked about situations that were happening in the real world and wondering who had an obligation or a duty to be able to intervene and to be helpful, to be able to serve others. And then during that class, their entire perspective on money and its relationship to faith began to be challenged. Now, if you, some of us don't want our, our ideas about money and faith to be challenged, right? I mean, if, if you don't want your perspective on money to be challenged, I need to tell you that reading the Bible is going to be frustrating for you because it's going to happen a lot, but especially like you should not, if, if you don't want your concepts about money to be challenged, you should not read the New Testament book of Luke or Amos or James Let's see. No, there's more. Timothy for sure. Okay, there's a lot. I would have to make a long list. But if you don't want your ideas about money to be challenged, you definitely should not turn to the New Testament book of Luke because Luke seems to be, out of all the Gospels, the one that records Jesus' most disruptive teachings about money. And there's this one parable, this one story that, that Luke reports Jesus telling in Luke chapter 16 that is particularly surprising. It's this story that we've come to call the parable of the shrewd, manager. It's not a popular one to preach on, but it's a story about a rich man, a business owner, who decides that it's time to fire his chief accountant, the person who was managing all his affairs. It's time to fire this guy because he thinks this guy's wasting my money. There, I, we could be doing a whole lot better without this guy, with somebody better equipped at the helm. And so he calls in his accountant, says, you're, you're done here. We're finished. This is not working. We're going a different direction, all of that kind of stuff. And this employee, this accountant starts panicking because he's at that stage in his career where he's been doing this long enough. He kind of knows how to do that, but he doesn't, he's not really sure what other marketable skills he has, where else he's going to go. So he's kind of worried. He's in there cleaning out his desk, putting away all the pictures, taking his diploma down off the wall, and suddenly a plan comes to him. He hatches an idea, and he thinks to himself, I know how I can ensure a soft landing for myself in the job market once I'm out of this place, but I've got to act fast. So he reaches in the bottom drawer of that desk, and he pulls out his Rolodex which is like a phone book. And a phone book is like 
the contacts app on your phone. Okay, that's what he did. He opened up the contacts app on his phone and he starts looking up the numbers of the offices of some of the, some of the clients, some of the vendors whose, uh, whose names are predominantly on the accounts receivable ledger for this company. He starts co- reaching out to some of the companies, some of the individuals that owe a big debt to the company that he is just now leaving. In fact, he calls one vendor who owes the boss 800 gallons of olive oil. Oil, all right, and he and he says, you know what? It's your lucky day today. He says we're we're kind of we're we're writing off some debt. We're looking looking for some write-offs here, and so he says, change that eight hundred dollar debt to just eight hundred gallon debt to just four hundred gallons. He says, mark that in half. You have my permission. And then he calls this second vendor who owes the boss a thousand bushels of wheat, and he says, you know what? Take twenty percent off of that. I know that you know it's just going to be it's just going to be between you and me. But you know. Mark that down. You don't owe us quite as much as the books say that you do. He's giving away favors. He's using the last little vestige of influence, the last little bit of authority that he has to set himself up so that tomorrow when he doesn't have a place to go to work, there will be some people who owe him some favors. He's managing the resources under his control so that when there are no more resources for him to control, he'll be taken care of. It's, it, it's sort of like, you know, taking all of the proprietary information, the customer information before you leave a company so that you can go and start your own, you know, like he's trying to make sure he's got some contacts who are going to take his call when he needs help in the future. And it's not ethical. And in our business world, it would probably get you sued and get you in a lot of trouble. But in this story, when the boss finds out about what the accountant has done, he hears all of the details and he thinks to himself, oh man. And he thinks, if I call these people and say, no, he was not authorized to do that, double the debt, put it back to 800 gallons of oil and 1,000 bushels of wheat. He says, if I make those calls, that's just going to look bad on me. He says, so I'm just going to have to just let it go. And he admires the outgoing employee, the fired employee. He says, boy, that was clever. That guy was sure smart on his way out. I have to applaud how shrewd he was. And this, is, this kind of story sounds confusing to me because of the actions of this accountant being so unethical. I mean, this story sounds like not the kind of example that I would expect Jesus to hold up for us to follow, but that's actually the point of the entire story. Because when you read how Jesus explains the meaning of this story in the next couple of verses, he's pointing to how this is how undiscipled people even behave. He says, people who belong to this world are more clever in dealing with their peers than are people who belong to the light. And then he says, and this is Jesus' piece of unconventional financial advice in this parable. He says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to make friends for yourselves so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into the eternal homes. Use the resources of this world, this era, this life, he says, so that when this era is finished, you will be welcomed into an eternal home in an eternal era. Jesus is pointing out, he says, even the people who don't get what's going on in the spiritual realm, even the people who don't get it, they understand that they can use the resources they control today to set themselves up for a better future tomorrow. But Jesus is trying to get us to think about a much broader perspective. He's trying to get us to think not just about how we can preserve our, our, the, the resources under our control for a retirement future. He's trying to get us to think about an eternal future, a timeline that's much, much longer. He's inviting us to consider how God would have us manage all of the resources that have been entrusted to us, placed under our control. In fact, Jesus closes that parable with this reflection. He says, Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. And then then he hits you right between the eyes here. He turns it on on you. He says, so if, if, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, 
If you've not been trustworthy in the resources in this era, then who's going to trust you, he says? Who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? He says, no one. And this is maybe Jesus' most famous statement about money in all the scriptures. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve. Now, notice the shift here. He doesn't say two masters again. He says, you cannot serve both God and money. And this is the passage that kept John and Greg awake at night at Harvard. This is the passage that was messing with these two business guys. Like this, this is the passage that after everything that they had learned growing up in church, after everything they had picked up from their families, after everything they'd been taught in their undergraduate programs, after everything they had learned on the job, after all the examples they, they had seen of other people in business and how they managed money, this was the one, this was the verse that had John and Greg thinking, hmm, this sounds different than what I've been hearing. I mean, here's two guys that came to Harvard to get better at making money, and they were already good at that. They came to Harvard to set themselves up for a more comfortable future as part of the 1%. But the, when they went across campus to the Divinity School, to this God and Money course, they learned, the more they learned about Jesus and what Jesus and the writers of Scripture have to say about money, the more they began to reconsider the conventional wisdom that they'd heard. The wisdom, the wisdom that had brought them to Harvard, the more they begin to question some of the advice that they had been listening to, some of it internal advice that they were telling themselves, and some of it was external advice that they'd been hearing in all those different contexts. But as they listened more and more to what Jesus and the writers of the Old Testament and the other writers of the New Testament had to say about money, they really began to question some of the advice that they had picked up along the way, even advice that they had picked up in church. You see, they'd grown up, maybe like some of you, in churches that had frequently talked about money. And, and the paradigm that was most often shared was that a disciple of Christ gives first, saves next, and then lives on the rest. And that's, that, that's a beautiful piece of wisdom, especially, especially for those who are not used to giving at all, or for those who need help getting their finances in order, or for those who are in a different financial strata, maybe, who are still trying to meet basic needs, the idea of putting God first in your finances is incredibly faithful. The priority is right, but there's an unspoken message behind that give, save, live priority. There's an unspoken message behind that that says once you've given the percentage that God expects and then you've saved the amount that, you're, that you've decided to save, then everything else is just yours to do with whatever you want to do. That's the assumption behind that model. And Greg and John started thinking, I don't even notice giving $15,000 a year. I don't even notice giving $27,000 a year. And I think God may have something to say about what I do with the rest of it, not just that first 10%. You know, everybody's got a different approach to how they handle money, and it was interesting that these two guys were brought together. Greg, before he went to business school and this class in the divinity school, before that he was a a spender. He was somebody who, if there was extra money around, it was to be used, and he was looking forward to whatever fun or luxury that would provide for him. John, on the other hand, was a saver. He was the one that wanted to retire so early, and so if there was extra money at the end of the month, it was to go into a savings account to prepare for a different day, for a a rainy day. And both of those are, are kind of our normal approaches, but these two guys started asking the question, what if... What if instead of being a saver or a spender, what if God might be asking me to be a servant with my resources? What if God might be inviting me into something bigger than I've considered before? 
These two guys, John and Greg, they took all of the learning that they did together and they wrote a book about it, a book that I commend to you. I read it this week. It's called God and Money, How We Discovered True Riches at Harvard Business School. I'd be thrilled for you to read it. I'm eager to let you know that the proceeds from the book don't go to John and Greg. They go to ministries that they support. But the reason, the, the reason I wanted to tell you about it it's because of some of the decisions that these two guys made. They left Harvard with MBAs and a brand new understanding about what the Lord was looking for them to do with their resources. And so since finishing their degrees, John and Greg, they've become convicted that what God wants them to do is to be accountable to each other for how they use 100% of their money for godly purposes. They've decided together that each one of their families will be transparent with one another about their financial dealings and about their financial decisions. They talk to each other about how much money they bring in in their, in their different business efforts. They talk to each other about their income, but they've also decided, each one of their families has decided on a cap, an amount of money that they will live on and say, beyond that, Everything we make there, we're not going to just continue to inflate our lifestyle. We're going, to, we're going to hold each other accountable to giving it away. And he says, we don't, we don't enforce that on anybody else. We're not prescribing that for anybody else. But he says, the more time we spent investing our, our attention in what God has to say about money, the more we were convinced that God wants more than the 10% we were giving that God wants to direct the 100% of our resources, that everything we own belongs to God. They said the more we studied this, the more we became convinced that all of our wealth and all of our possessions are meant to be used for God's purposes. They said we, we came to understand that wealth is like dynamite that has great potential for good and great potential for harm, and it has to be handled carefully. They said we became more aware that worldly wealth is fleeting. On this end of the timeline, worldly wealth is fleeting, but that heavenly treasure is eternal. And they, they wanted to invest themselves in heavenly treasure. It changed everything about their outlook about money because they stopped seeing their paycheck as a, 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 the income that just had 10% skimmed off the top, you know, like a, like a deduction on your paycheck that goes to God and then everything else could be theirs. They said, we started to see our paycheck as God investing in our part of the mission. And I just wonder, I just wonder if it would be possible for us to reimagine what God is doing when God entrusts money to us. Because it's so easy, it's so normal, it's so natural to assume that whatever God gives to us is just for our enjoyment. And please don't hear me saying that God doesn't care about us having enjoyable experiences. This is, God wants us to live abundant life. But part of living abundant life is being able to see beyond ourselves. What if we stopped seeing our income as a paycheck that God just takes a cut off the top of? And what if we started understanding that God's inviting us to be a partner? That God is inviting us to the table. That God is inviting us to be a part of fulfilling the mission and joining in the mission and looking for ways to allocate resources so that the mission gets done. What if we stopped thinking of ourselves as employees and instead we started thinking of ourselves as partners with God? Jesus says in the book of John, he says, I am no longer referring to you as my servants. I am now calling you my friends. He says, as if to say, I have become poor so that you might become rich. I have lowered myself so that you might be with me. Jesus has put himself on our level so that we might be able to serve together. And God's calling us to something bigger, something bigger than maybe we've dreamed of, something bigger than maybe we've been willing to consider. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart will have enough light to see 
what is the hope of God's call? Which means I pray that you'll be able to understand what it is that God's calling you to, that it's something big. He says, I pray that your eyes will have enough light to see what is the hope of God's call, what is the richness of God's glorious inheritance among believers. See, the pattern, the pattern that was given to us in the Old Testament was bring 10%. And then Jesus, Jesus showed us what it looks like to bring 100% of yourself to the mission of the kingdom of God. And aren't we thankful? Aren't we thankful? Because our story is a story of being invited to the table where we didn't deserve to sit. Our story is a story of having a place saved for us when we shouldn't have been invited in the first place. We would have been fortunate to have been called servants in the house of the Lord. We would have been fortunate to be doorstops in God's dining room. And yet, Jesus has said, I have saved a place with your name on it. I've made a place for you I've invited you to come and be a part of me, to come and be in fellowship with me, to come and join me in what I'm doing to reconcile the world. I've saved you a spot, and there are empty spots at this table for people who don't yet know they're invited. Would you help me get the word out? This is our story. It's a story of being invited, a story of being included, a story of being accepted where we didn't deserve to be. And so, as John and Greg left Harvard, they decided that they couldn't hear the warnings and the wisdom of Jesus about money and just move on as if they hadn't heard. They couldn't ignore what they had learned. And it had to shape every decision for them about money from there on out. Their gratitude for who Jesus is, their gratitude for what God has done through Christ was too great to let them just pay a membership fee and then be done. They said, I've got to change everything. And they're in the process of it. I'd love for you to read the book. I'd love to hear your feedback on it. But even more than that this morning, the question for us is, does Jesus know what he's talking about? Is Jesus telling us the truth when he says that worldly possessions are going to pass away, they're not going to last, but heavenly treasure is eternal? That we should prepare ourselves, invest ourselves, use the resources that we have today to try to set up the future in God's presence that we want. Does Jesus know what he's talking about? Because if he does, then it's worth investing going all in. It's worth investing our whole selves.